Welcome. <laughs> so for, for all the foreigners who are jet lagged, um, I hope the chocolate helps. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about developer portals. Um, uh, because uh, like I, I, I put the, I, I started doing these slides because I'm trying to disprove my theory that um, our company, uh, Prolifix, is the only company in the world that is completely dedicated to developer portals. So if you know somebody else, like a company, it's not a freelancer or something, but if you know a company that's specialized only in developer portals, please come and talk to me about it, because I want to know. Because as far as I know, we're the only ones. Um, and um, before I do my talks, I've got this thank you thing, this thank you ritual that I do. Um, because I can only be here because of my colleagues uh, who help us to, to you know, do the business and make the money that helps me fly here. <laughs> um, and uh, I want to do special thanks for Dora because she helped me to make these slides beautiful. I used to do them myself and they looked like crap. And now, <laughs> now they're pretty. <laughs> um, and I'd like to thank my family, um, but they're here in the audience today, so. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so you, you'll, you'll, if you are interested, Freya has a really interesting talk about global warming together with me in the Samurai track later today. Um, so, but what is a developer portal? Um, one of the most important things you should remember after this talk is that developer portals are more than reference docs. Reference docs like Swagger or OpenAPI spec um, if you only have that, that's not a developer portal. <laughs> that's just reference docs. <laughs> so that's, if you remember that, we're good. Then, then you, you, know, you take away the most important message. Um, because developer portals should really be self-service uh, support hubs for your APIs, uh, or at least that's one of the functions that they can fulfill. Um, they can also be an interface for an API initiative. So if you're doing uh, a large initiative to get people to start using APIs, uh, they can help you communicate about the different aspects of your API. Um, they're also kind of like a communication nexus, and that's a hard word, um, but like a place where all the different types of stakeholders come together um, to talk with each other. So a developer portal needs to serve not only the developers that will use your API, but also the people that will need to write about your API and the developers that are creating APIs. So it's important to think about them, especially if you're working in a larger company. Um, and another really key thing is that developer portals are there um, as a trust signal. Because APIs are very, um, they're very ephemeral. Um, they're, they're just like code up in the air. <laughs> And if, if anything changes at the company that owns an API, they might disappear overnight. So developers need to trust you. And um, there's only a few ways, well, there's several ways to gain trust uh, for your API, like having a, a good API design is one way to get a, um, a trust for your API. But that's a little bit harder to see. One of the easiest ways to get trust for your API is by having a good, well-designed developer portal because it shows that you care about your developers and um, it, it's, uh, it's very easy to give the signal about your API. So what kind of portals do you need to build? I think there's two large groups of portals. And funny enough, in our industry, most people are talking about this type of portal, self-service uh, support, uh, where either you have customers uh, like the API companies, the startups that's, you know, that are mostly sponsoring this event. Um, uh, well, they're not really startups anymore, they're more scale-ups, but, um, but uh, they're, they're outward facing. The purpose of these portals is to get new developers to use APIs. Those developers could be working at a partner or at like just as a, as a consumer, as a customer, um, but it's, it's all turning around self-service support. The other type of developer portals are there to accelerate innovation. And this is the type of developer portals that you don't hear too much about. I have a whole talk about this type of portals. Uh, I can't talk about it today because I have little time. <laughs> but um, if you're interested, if you work at a large company 
and you need to uh, help developers be more productive, um, then you need to be looking at uh, innovation acceleration and platform like um, um, platform enablement uh, and things like that. And, and that's a whole other stream of, of uh, thinking and, and uh, information. And I, yeah, I've got more talks about this, but I'll, I'll, I'll um, explain later where you can find information about that. So how, but first, um, how does the developer portal contribute to developer experience, the X, uh, that's what it stands for. I think, I like to think about developer experience as the inverse of API friction, because it makes it very easy to think about it. Uh, because developer experience is this, you know, well, what is it really, <laughs> all right? Uh, it's, um, it's like UX, uh, how, how do you really define that? It's so many things that it's very hard to like contain it. It's a lot easier to think about friction and to think about where can you eliminate friction along uh, the developer journey. And this is the downwards journey. This is once you already have APIs. There's also an upwards journey that's for the other type of portals. But for the downwards journey, for the, um, the journey of the developer that needs to use an API, um, there's these main six steps. Uh, I've seen companies add a lot more steps with a lot of different things, but I believe that these are the most important individual steps uh, along the journey. So what you want to try to do is to look at friction in each of these steps and how you can remove it. Um, because ultimately, the usage of your API it's gonna depend on both the developer experience, so the friction that you remove, and the perceived API value. Now, let me explain that a little bit, because um, one of the mistakes, you know, remember that I told you that the developer portal should not only be about reference docs, uh, Swagger, it needs to be more than Swagger. One of the key things is that you need to explain people why is your API, what is it good for? What, well, how is it going to help uh, developers do their job? Um, what are its, its features? What are its benefits? And um, so what you want to do is to clearly communicate the perceived, like the value of your API. So that's the perception of the value is going to go up. Um, because together with the developer experiences, uh, those are going to determine uh, how much API usage you're going to get. Um, if people think your API is crap, they won't use it. If your developer experience is crap, they won't use it either. So both have to go up. And both of these, you can actually influence with your developer portal. Now, <laughs> here comes the, the, the meat of this talk. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> um, so we've been, when we started doing developer portals, we looked at the space and we tried to understand like, what is really in a developer portal? Because there's so many different types of documentation and everybody's calling it a little bit different. And we, we try to create some sort of classification of the types of developer um, portals, uh, sorry, developer documentation types. Um, like what kind of information do you need on a developer portal? And I'd like to start with blogs. Now, I know some of you don't really need a blog or shouldn't have a blog. Let's call it, say it like that. If you cannot continu continuously add new information to your blog, new blog posts, you should not have a blog. Don't do it um, because it's worse to have an empty blog than to have no blog at all. But if you have people in your company um, that can help to create content for your blog, a blog is a really powerful tool um, for two reasons. One, um, it gives a feeling that things are moving. It's a trust signal, just as I said earlier. But also, the second one is that it's unstructured. That is both good and bad because, um, you know, it's bad because unstructured is harder to find information. It's good because it allows you to experiment. So blogs are great to experiment with new types of content. If you don't really know yet all the types of content you want to have on your portal, um, a blog can be a very good place uh, to help you with that. Second, Landing pages. These are really, you know, these are not the obvious ones, right? <laughs> I don't know if you expected me saying like landing pages are important. Um, the reason why I think landing pages are really important is that they help 
uh, your audience to self-select. Because developer portals are not just about developers. Developer portals today are also about business people that need to make decisions, decision makers. They don't understand code. They are not going to read your API documentation. They want to understand what an API is good for so that they can tell their developers, this is the API you're going to use. So, um, and landing pages help with this because beautiful landing pages that are um, like with responsive design, um, they, they can be ways to guide uh, your audience to different sections of your portal, like a more business area, more developer oriented, really experienced development oriented, and etc. Using call to actions like buttons that send you to different areas in your site. Tutorials. Tutorials are super important um, because tutorials show you how to do something uh, to help uh, developers to get started. Um, if, you're, if you have SDKs, so if you're targeting different developer communities and you've built implementations of your APIs for different communities, <coughs> you should have tutorials for those different communities. So don't make a tutorial for your API, make a tutorial for your SDK if you have SDKs. Guides. These are different from tutorials in that guides show different problems and how your product solves them. They're kind of a mixed content because they're both business and development because they help with uh, explaining what your product can do for the business people, but they also help with explaining how to do something for the developers. Um, and, and as that, they play an important function on your portal. Conceptual documentation. It's a, a difficult word. It took me um, like it took me a while to really grasp that completely. Like, what does it really mean? Um, but basically, conceptual documentation are all these types of documentation that explain um, like how you how you think about your product. Because often, just like here today, we have um, uh, domain language words that we use a lot that for other people are completely new and they don't understand it. Uh, and you might want to explain uh, what a word means. For example, dunning in payment gateways, um, it's a process through which you can uh, get rid of customers that don't have uh, a way to pay you without losing customers that might have another credit card. <laughs> um, dunning is something that if you haven't done payments integrations yet, is really difficult to understand. So you might want to explain what that word means. And probably there's other words like that in your business that people normally won't understand. So you need to explain those. Then there's the reference documentation. Now, I told you reference documentation does not equal that portal, but reference documentation is very important. <laughs> if you don't have reference documentation, um, you, know, you can't really use an API. <laughs> or at least not, not, a, not a traditional API. Maybe, maybe it's um, with GraphQL, but even there, probably not. Um, fast API key provisioning. How can people get access to your API? If they need to send you an email, wait for a month until you answer, then send another email with more details, that's uh, a really bad experience. I've heard companies that have this kind of process inside. Like I've been at companies where it takes a week until you can start using an API. Even for company for people that work inside of that company, which is crazy. Um, so fast API key provisioning is one of the most important things for a good developer experience. One of my bad peeves. So remember trust how developer portals need to help with getting trust. How do you communicate about your, your uh, policies? What are your contracts? Um, are you clear or is it lots of small letters that nobody understands? <laughs> um, one, of, one of the things I like to think is that it's really important to clearly communicate about um, the contracts that you're making as a developer with a company when you start using an API. Is this API going to disappear? Like, how long do, will I get from the day that you start deprecating and that it, you say, okay, we no longer support this API, 
how many months or years do I get to change to another API? And things like that. Um, and, and explaining that clearly in, a, in a, um, um, an easy to understand language will help a lot in, um, in getting trust from developers. Because developers, there's a little bit of cowboy coding happening, but I think we've all been burned before and we've all had APIs that disappear and we've learned that you can't just blindly trust, you have to like do some research. Pricing, for me, is a really important signal. For two reasons. One, obviously, can I afford this? Two, are you going out of business? <laughs> because if there's no business model, if you're not making money, probably you're not gonna keep doing this. And then either you're gonna do a bait and switch, like get me to use your API and then suddenly check out the prices. Now, there's a few companies that have done that. <laughs> Or your API is just going to disappear, like, sorry, this was an experiment, we're gone, bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it was free anyway, right? <laughs> so I think it's important to give a signal about how you're sustainable and how you're going to stay in business. And then um, support. It's like, how do, you, uh, how do you provide support? How can people connect with you? What are your support strategies? Now, I've put a forum here on, on, on the screen. Be careful. <laughs> Forums are very hard. If you have a community manager, someone who's going to actively manage your forum, go ahead, maybe. <laughs> but maybe you should look at other places where your developer community is already participating and asking questions. Maybe you can go to Stack Overflow and answer questions there rather than on your own site. Forums? on your own developer portal are only really, really important, I believe, either when you have a very strong community or very strong brand, or uh, second, if, um, if you have certain APIs that are not public. So we see a lot of our customers have partner APIs, uh, APIs that are only accessible to um, very specific people. Um, like sometimes we have customers that have one customer that has a custom API, so they have their own API, and the other customer can't know about it because you know, because they don't want to build another of those APIs, and they might get angry because, hey, why do you get a better service than we are getting? That's not fair. So, and in those cases, it might be useful to have to have something like this. But it's you know, you have to think about this very well. Don't just say, oh, we want a forum, because uh, an empty forum is like a tumbleweed town in uh, Western movies. Uh, it's it's a bad signal. Here we go. Um, next is SDKs. Um, Cristiano Betta uh, did um, an interesting talk. Well, he, he did his seven deadly sins of developer experience talk at uh, API the Docs uh, two days ago, and he talked about the dangers of not owning your SDKs because if you as a company make an API and you don't have a, a software development kit somebody else will make one. And then that becomes the official SDK. And if they don't take care of it, then it's gonna be bad for your business. So you need to think about this. And if you put all of these things together, because that was a lot, <laughs> you get these questions. What is this? How do I get started? Uh, what do I need to understand, etc. And this is a lot, right? It's a lot of information. Uh, a lot of work. Um, so a, a lot, often people will ask me like, okay, that's just too much. What's the minimal viable product? Like if we get started with a developer portal, what is it that we really need? So I personally believe that the MVP for a developer portal should be this. You know, you could argue, but um, I think you need to at least have like landing pages with some basic business information about what this does, and what is it good for, tutorials so that people can get started, uh, the reference docs, obviously, um, maybe a blog if you can afford it, and then contact. If you can't afford a blog, you can leave the blog out. I'll also share my slides, uh, but thank you for taking pictures. Um, now, 
few more concepts before I have to close off. Think ahead, because you're going to have different people adding contents to your dev portal, different authors. Um, that will add landing pages, those are more marketing people, API specifications, the business people, and other documentation, uh, possibly in Markdown, by technical writers or by developers. Think about this. Maybe you want to do docs as code. And then the last point, think about your documentation lifecycle. How will you keep it up to date? Um, maybe you can do doc ops um, with automated testing for your documentation um, as part of your, uh, maybe it's part of your agile process. Where to learn more? Um, we do the developer portal at uh, the Dev Portal Awards, which is a, um, an award specifically for developer portals. Um, it's a global event. Last one was in London. We're working on the next one. Uh, we have API the Docs, a one day event in Chicago in April. There will be one in Europe also. Hopefully next year, also here in Tokyo. <laughs> there was just one here last week, right? Yeah, but that was uh, just a meetup. So this would be like a whole day. Uh, event. And um, we do a lot of research, we share a lot of information, and you can find more about it on uh, our newsletter, um, um, which is like stuff that we research and other people's content that we, we um, share with our, our community. So go and have a look if, you're, um, if you need more help with this. And that's all, folks. Mm -hmm. <laughs>